four options for you. Level par to five under, six under to nine under, ten under to thirteen under, fourteen under or better. Tell us what you think. What do you guys think? We've had a mixture of winning scores here at Celtic Manor, ranging from 22 under, Scott Strange, I think it was, to six under and Jai D, I think, as well. So everything in between. Or do you think it's going to be something else? John, go on, you go first. Well, I tell you what, after a couple of little changes, we'll get to that later, but I'm going between the old 10 and 13. I mean, it's going to play BC out there. This is probably one of the longest golf courses we play all year, if not the longest. So, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a stiff test. If the wind gets up as well, it'll keep the scores a little bit lower. OK, come on, Kit. Well, five double digits under par, five single digits under par winning total since we've been here on the 2010 course. So it's a pretty even split, but you know what? These guys are good, and the more they play it, the more they figure it out. They've had three loops around here in the last couple of years, so they're starting to get a feel for it. I'm going to go a little bit lower than John. I'm going 14 under par. Okay. Okay. I know, John, you know the course well. It's a beast, 7,503 yards, plenty of water in play as well. What do the players need to do, and what kind of player does it suit? It's, it suits a, a big hitter, it really does. I mean, a stroke, we see the length there, it's over 7,500 yards long. So, par 71, I mean, literally, I mean, it, you know, the front nine is just 110 yards shy of being 4,000 yards. I mean, it's a whopper, it really is. You come, you know, there's three of the par fives out there, well over 600 yards. Par threes, there's not many that are under 200. It's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute beast. You know, coming off of, say, like a Sean Crocker from, say, last week, you know, great ball striker. As we've seen, this is going to suit him. You know, the bigger hitters, Wicko Nienarbo, found some good form last week. You know, he's the kind of guy who will come here, relish this. He can get drives way down there. It's just how you play your iron play. I think that's a real big key about this. You know, great iron play into these greens. Sets yourself up for loads of birdies. Can, can I say something? Tong, oh, Chai, Tong Chai won round here. He yeah. is not a long hitter. No, but it was, uh, it was firm and fast. OK, but it might dry out Which this week. I was going to say it's going to dry out this week. So, so we could. could see someone different, maybe. Yes, she Even could. though I actually think a long hit is going to win as well. <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, I was going to say, Josh, we're going to get you to make your prediction. So are you going long or short? <laughs> After all no, that, and I then know, you flip no, back that I am going to. I was just trying to give some balance there, though. The devil's advocate, Josh Hamlin, ladies and course, gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. I don't blame you. Come on, who's on your lips? I know you love a prediction. Look, I picked Jens Dantop last week. Mm -hmm. The guy, it doesn't matter where you're playing good golf. If it's on the challenge or wherever, you're, you're playing good golf. The guy has had a win in seven top tens, I think, in his last nine events. That's obscene. Yeah. I tell you what, I'm not going for him, though. And there's a reason <laughs> why. And it's later in the clubhouse, and okay. we'll see why, and we'll talk about it. I'm going for Matty Schmidt. Oh, okay. Leading the Barbasol going into Sunday uh, a few weeks ago. Eight top tens. He's eight times, sorry, he's been in the top ten going into Sunday. Yeah. A very long hitter as well. Uh, silver medal winner at Lytham as mm -hmm. well, if you, do, if you remember. Yeah. And I remember I saw him at Northern Ireland on the range. I was with you and I just watched him. I mean, really silky, pure striker of the ball. Yeah. I'm surprised he hasn't won yet, I'll be honest. He's had a very quick rise. I think this is really going to suit him. Though, out here. Oh, he's trending in the right direction. Yeah. I think it's inevitable that he will win, Josh. I'm with you on that. That question, good yeah. player. All right, John, you checked a couple of names out. Who's your one name that you're going for this week? Uh, well, I'm across between two players. I'm um, Oman and Arin. I'm thinking kind of you know weird things happen. You know circumstances. We've had uh, Tony Fennell win back-to-back -back events. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering is Sean Crocker yeah. gonna Sean Crocker gonna follow suit and win back-to-back? -back? But I'm gonna go for someone who doesn't hit it as far as like a Sean Crocker, but it is a great ball striker nonetheless and one of the best swings. Jordan Smith. Mm. It's a great shout. He yeah. is the bookie's favourite this week. Jew, he he? Is He's Jew. He is Jew. One win already. Jew. I'm going to chuck Callum Shinkwin's name in there mm. as well. Top 11 in his last three trips here. Yep. Playing well at the moment and, and a big hitter mm. as well. Mm. Of course, 12 years ago, it hosted the Ryder Cup here, the 2010 course. And we caught up with Director of Golf, Jim McKenzie, to find out a bit more about that legacy. <laughs> golf is a never-ending feast. It's a picture that's never finished. We're constantly evolving, permanently working. The time never really stands still for us here. The original manor house was built years and years ago by a guy called Thomas Powell. He was the world's first millionaire. It then became a maternity home. It was an American naval hospital during the Second World War. Our owner, Sir Terry Matthews, was actually born in the maternity home. So he's, if you like, come back, bought the old maternity home, developed it into the resort that we have today. The 
candidate venue for the Ryder Cup was the Wentwood Hills Golf Course, which Robert Trent Jones Jr. and Kyle Phillips designed from about 1996 onwards. And there was a rise and fall in that golf course of 104 metres, um, which is okay going down, but is not insignificant coming up. So subsequently we bought more land and we built holes 1 to 5, we built hole 14, holes 16 through 18, remodelled some of the original Wentwood Hills and in 2008 we opened the 2010 course, which is the one we have now. October's typically quite a good month here in, in South Wales and when you look back at the records it's generally fairly dry and indeed we had no rain for a month before the Ryder Cup and the Thursday the skies literally started to go grey. I was called to see the on-site meteorologist and he said you're probably going to have the, the worst three or four days of your life. We had looked at volunteer levels and we ended up with a group of uh, somewhere in the region of about 160. We couldn't have done with one less, we needed every single one. My wife came and pushed water off, my son came and pushed water off, um, next door neighbour came to help. And there was moments where I just stood back and wondered at it, it was quite extraordinary. After what we had been through, it was quite bizarre. Graham McDowell playing in short sleeves, and you know all the guys are playing in t-shirts, and you know the crowd for the most part are without jackets and, and umbrellas. And um, what the world remembers, if you like, is that magic Monday where it all fell into place. It was quite a day. When the match was conceded. The crowd just ran onto the green, and in actual fact, you couldn't see a square metre of the green anywhere. The flag went missing, the pin went missing, even the whole cup appeared in a pub in Killeen across the, uh, the, the river that, that evening. It was just absolutely pandemonium, but true to fashion, it was in play the following morning on the Tuesday when the first of our members went through with, with no damage. On a sunny afternoon in Wales, the celebrations begin. This golf course and this clubhouse were purpose-built for the Ryder Cup. That's a major draw to our customers. That when they walk into the building, we've got Ryder Cup logos on the carpet. We have a member of the golf team take you down into the locker room, show you Tiger Woods' locker, maybe give you Tiger Woods' locker for the day, and take you out onto the balcony, show people where Monty and the guys stood with the champagne above the crowds, and indeed they can see up the 18th hole. As a footballer, you can't just pitch up and have a game of football at Wembley or a game of rugby at the Principality Stadium. You can come here to Kilty Manor, which is a public access facility, and uh, walk in the Footprints of Heroes. From a Ryder Cup course to a Ryder Cup hero, as we're about to be joined by a three-time DP World Tour winner. <laughs> Jamie, great to have you with us. Brilliant VT there. Looking back at that, that must get the old juices flowing. Well, it does indeed. Um, <laughs> it's nice to see some uh, great uh, memories like that. Um, yeah, you know, there were some great victories back then and, um, you know, we're still pushing and tr practicing hard to uh, try and emulate that and create something going forward. Back in the homeland this week in Wales, proud Welshman, looking forward to getting going in front of your home fans. Yeah, it is. It's great to be back down here. Um, I love coming back here. It, this is where pretty much it all started for me because uh, I got an invite to play in uh, the Welsh Open back in 2001. It was um, one of seven invites and um, I finished fourth, missed the playoff by a shot. So uh, that's where really it all started and, uh, you know, went on from there. It's a brilliant course as well, isn't it? And great to have this facility here in South Wales. 
Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, they've done such a great job. I mean, at one point it was incredibly hilly and they've moved it all down to the flat now. So uh, it's much easier walking down there and uh, it sets up for what is a great test of golf. All right, looking back, we saw some great clips in the VT there. What are the moments that really stand out from you from your life on tour? I mean, obviously the Irish Open was a big one. Um, you know, that was my first win. It took a while. Um, and then I got in the top 50 in the world from there. Um, and after that, you know, things started to pick up. You're playing with all the best players in the world all the time. In Ireland. Um, sorry, here we go. Here we go, oh, yeah. Oh, we walked, you walked in for about six foot out. I know, you know, <laughs> I, I thought the putt was short and it went straight <laughs> in the middle, so it was always nice to, to finish like that. And then obviously um, the other wins, Czech win was huge for me to, to cement my place in the Ryder Cup team. Uh, and then, you know, that you can't really beat the Ryder Cup moment for me. The, to be on the part of a winning team was incredible. Um, and to be in a position to hit the winning shot was just the icing on the cake. So, yeah, fantastic memories. Yeah. Crowds there at the, at the Irish as well, incredible back then. Yeah, well. it was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, I think there was something, there was a crazy match. It's like being at an Open. Mm. Uh, the Irish fans are so <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, a bit more buff then, I better get back, <laughs> better get back in the gym. <laughs> breathing, breathing. Um, so yeah, great memories. Um, it, what a place to do it at the Irish Open cool. as well. All that, you know, well, it's 10 years ago now, isn't it? So um, yeah, amazing golf course, great crowds. Mm. Come on, Josh, we've got to have some questions. I tell you what, well, we've got to talk about Ryder Cup. Philip Townsend's asked, you played in 2014. Yeah. Obviously we're here this week and this was 2010. You would have watched 2010. Did you watch it and think, I want some of this? It was Medina. Uh, really? Yeah, that got me going. Obviously, I saw it down here and it gets the juices flowing, but at the time, you know, I was playing okay, but not well enough. And then things started to pick up. I watched, uh, I think I listened to the radio on the way to the Dunhill, uh, listening to Medina. And it was just, I mean, if you ever, you listen to golf on the radio, it's incredible. It's really, mm -hmm. uh, you really get into it because obviously you're trying to imagine what's going on. Um, and that was incredible. Uh, obviously, it was amazing here. Then following up with Medina, which was arguably one of the best ones ever, mm. to then listen to that and think, I just want to get in the next one. And I just worked really hard that next two years and, and managed to get in the next one. So, yeah, awesome. Yeah, not a bad time to do it as well. Yeah. I was going to mention the Ryder Cup. I mean, when it came to your shot there that you just stuck in stiff and that sealed the deal. I mean, moment of clarity. You know, come on. What are you like over that shot? How are your legs feeling? You don't seem a nervous speed? man, Jamie. <laughs> we ain't. No, do you know. Very the two is one up and two G's yeah. 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 Look at this. Look at this, eh? No, do you know when you want all the stars to kind of align? I had a perfect yardage. It was a perfect wind direction. Um, my, I don't. It was a wedge from one four six. Yeah. The pin was tight on the right. Um, so my bad shot with the wedge that week had been slightly left. Um, so. Yeah, I couldn't fail really because the pin's tight right. I can aim as far right as I want, can't hit it right. Yeah. It's always going to come in slightly on the wind. Um, and it was just, yeah, everything was perfect. And the shot when it took off, um, it looked good, but you don't know to what extent until you get down there. <laughs> yeah. I want to know how it feels to have just hit the shot of your life in the moment of your life and to know it and to be walking down that fairway having just achieved that to just the incredible applause and adjuration of the fans. I mean, yeah, it was unbelievable. Um, I mean, it looks like it's absolutely stone dead, but I can't start doing cartwheels down there. Because <laughs> you would have. I would have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd have got... good at Michael Jackson moves and all that. <laughs> well, I thought you were going to do something. Well, something. back in the day. I know. But walking down there, obviously you don't know how near it is. It looks stone dead, but if I go daft and I get down there, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's suddenly done that and it's four feet. Yeah. He holds his putt and you're thinking, hang on, what, you know. So I had to stay focused until I got down and saw then it's a foot from the hole and then you can start celebrating and boy, was it big celebrations after yeah. that. It did look oh, I thought we you were, were going to do the caterpillar, I really did. Whether well, it was, like, was in the bar after. <laughs> yeah, was it, did you want to hold the part? <laughs> or, yeah, I was going to ask that. Or were you happy with that sort of ultimate mic drop moment, if you like, of hitting the shot and that's done and dusted, the putter can stay in the bag? Yeah, it was just, yeah, it was just really special, the fact that, I hit the best shot I possibly could. I mean, my wedge play is, was, was pretty good that week, but to hit it that well at that time, um, you know, it was just a great feeling, you know, as you're walking down there and everyone's going absolutely ballistic. I mean, I remember Tom Watson trying to shake my hand. McGinley jumps on my back. Neither of them said, it's all over, Sonny. <laughs> and then, and then, because we'd had a bit of, there'd been a bit of sledging early on in the week. Strick had given me a bit of sledging early on in a match. So Tom Watson's kind of shook, trying to shake me hand. 
I don't really know what he's doing. He didn't stop me and go, it's all over. He just sort of, yeah. and I just sort of palmed him <laughs> off and just, I've got to get this job done. Because McGinley's saying, focus on your match, focus on your match. Don't get involved in anything around you. Just win your point and let the rest take care of itself. So I'm zoned in, just going, just like, McGinley's jumping on my back, get off. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Watson's trying to shake me, do one. And I'm just going down like this, trying to Game make place. sure, and yeah. then I see it, it's yeah. stiff, and then it's all over. But I wish somebody had said something, so I could have done Carl. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Shirt off. Um, yeah, shirt <laughs> yeah. off. You would, you would have as well, yeah, Jamie. It would have been a bit mad, yeah. but to what extent, you don't know. But yeah. the fact is, it finished professionally, um, and it was, <laughs> it was just a fantastic week in my memories, yeah. Oh, in all of our memories. Yeah. Before um, we just came on air, Josh, a bit of gardening uh, well, chat. Now, it's funny this, because I know, not many might not know this, David Wilson does, because he's just asked the question, how's the garden? You are an incredibly keen gardener, Jamie. I am, I'm sometimes too keen. I had to, um, <laughs> I had to, to sort of slow down a little bit. We've got uh, Here we 15. go, look. Here we go. Yeah, that's an impressive set up. Right yeah, we've there. got 15 raised beds and a polytunnel, uh, which keeps me busy. That's garlic. Yeah. Just drying, getting ready to be stored. There we go. Look at that. Bit of sweet corn. Not sure the numpty is on the left. But, uh, <laughs> bit of sweet just corn. just a big bit of garlic there. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm really into it, sometimes yeah. too into it. Sometimes, I, like, if I have a week off, I'll say to the missus, I'm just going to pop into the garden for half an hour just to check on it. Yeah, yeah, crack on. I'll join you in a minute, and then... <laughs> Three hours go, later. I'll come yeah. back in. I'll go, oh, should we go and pick the kids up from school? She'll go, I've already got them. <laughs> They're you know, in bed. <laughs> yeah. It's like five hours will just pass, and it's just the most relaxing uh, thing that you can possibly do. Uh, great for the soul. I love it. Um, literally, we grow everything from... Onions, garlic, sweet corn. Marrows uh, and melons. Yeah, yeah everything, 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 yeah. everything. My, my girlfriend and I, we've just put in two raised beds for the first time in our garden, four foot by eight foot. Yeah. Very similar to what we just saw in your yeah. can you Can you give us any tips? Um, Beginners grow, tips. Well, if you do it properly, you've got to grow everything from seed, which we've done. <laughs> but it's much easier to start things off onions and sets and buy a few small plants from garden centres and just chuck them in and let them go. That's the easiest way to do it. Okay. But growing it from seed, you stop things from bolting and it's easier that way mm. in the long run because yeah. of the, you know, when things set seed, they don't necessarily, if it's gone from... If I'll be sending you updates. From seed. I'm going to be sending you updates, photos. <laughs> uh, yeah, just that, that. <laughs> yeah, we'll but it's that. very rewarding. Everything's flourishing at the moment and everything we're eating, you know, sort of daily, weekly, is great fun. Gardeners world, everyone. Get the kids involved, brilliant. Yeah. What have you had an extra half a stone <laughs> off you, boy, now then? Yeah. Johnny. Try it, Johnny, try it. <laughs> it's been brilliant to have you in to share your stories of the Ryder Cup and winning on tour. And, of course, your amazing garden as well. Well, <laughs> Jamie said he might need to lose a few pounds, and John's been going over to the physio truck to find out how the players do that and what facilities they've got right here on site. Well, welcome to the Health and Performance Unit here on the DP World Tour. This is where the magic happens. The players get a little niggle, they're out on the golf course, pull a muscle or two, they get in there, they get it all sorted out, but I tell you what, let's get in there and I'll give you a closer look at what goes on. Well, we've got John Catlin here, a multiple winner on the DP World Tour, and he's going through his paces, Simon is training. Simon, what are we trying to achieve here, buddy? So, really, this is a drill just to um, try to improve his lateral trunk stability. Okay. So, like, you know, he's, he's working hard there through, through the muscles of his torso. Um, try not to rest the dumbbell there on the bottom. John, keep it off the ground, that's it. Yeah. So you're trying to rotate through, almost thread the needle, and then come back. That's it. And what's that going to give him extra from what he's had before in the past? I mean, he's just looking for a bit more stability in his swing, really, hopefully. You yeah. know, with that bit of stability on his lateral hip and his trunk uh, hopefully should help him, you know, stay nice and stable in his swing. Yeah, and I've seen you just, like, pumping this bad boy up, <laughs> up and down in the air. What's that trying to do for you, John? Just trying to get a little more explosive. You know, one thing we're trying to do on a golf swing, we're coming through and trying to get a little more ground force and get a little more up coming through it which is similar to what we're doing with that. And so. you're seeing the benefits pretty quickly? Yeah, definitely, definitely seeing. Good man. Well, mate, keep it going. And is there any, how long does this whole session last? 45 minutes to an hour, and I'm usually in here about three times a week. Can't beat it. DP World Tour, man. Physio truck, can't beat it, can you? It's all on your doorstep. And look, come with me. We'll leave John to it, his man Simon. Well, mate, this is where it all happens as well. So we've got Carlos Poom here, having a bit of work done. Yeah, a little bit of trouble with his neck, but this is what it's all about. I've come in here many times, you know, broken man a little bit, maybe pulled a few muscles, 
and this is where they put you all back together. We've got our main man, Nigel, over here, the physio. No, Nigel. Hey, tell us. I mean, this is an amazing place, mate. It's all kitted up, no stone unturned. I mean, come on, tell us some of the old injuries that you've had to deal with and how you've, you know, got them out of jail, if you want to call it. Well, we see anything and everything in here, and that's what we're here is a one stop shop for the players where mm. they come in, they've got a splinter in their finger, or they've been in a car crash the night before, or anything. So we're here to be able to deal with everything that could possibly walk through the door. And it's just about keeping the players on the golf course, keeping them playing and playing as well as they can. So yeah. we have physios, chiros, osteopaths, sports medicine docs, um, radiology screening, skin cancer screening, basically everything. Um, so it really is a, a full package for the players. Yeah, and you 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 know you offer obviously kind of that uh, safeguard for the players. They come here and know they can get absolutely sorted. I mean, you got like Dan Torp. You know, was it two weeks ago? Hurt his neck. He's had two good results. How do you figure him out, you know, uh, with his neck as well? Um, yeah, I mean, we see players all the time who are really, really struggling and we can have great results with them. Um, people that we're going to pull out and end up doing well or even winning tournaments. So that's yeah. obviously a very satisfying part of the job. Um, and that's what we're here for, really, to make sure the players can keep playing. And doctor as well? You yeah, so we have a sports medicine team that are uh, here every week, at least one doctor, sometimes two, um, as well as offering sort of like GP services for the players if they've got infections, sore throats, other type issues going on. So we have a full pharmacy here. Um, so whatever the player needs, we can basically deal with it on site right away and get them back out on the golf course. Well, oh, brilliant, Nigel. Thank you very much, mate, and thanks for having us. And this is an insight to the DP World Tour. And yeah, this is the physio trip where all the magic happens and gets the players up and ready to go again. Well, we always get value for money for Jamie Donaldson, <laughs> so we couldn't let him go without talking about the legendary five wood, and it's a bit like Trigger's Broom, had a bit of a, a rough time of late. Yeah, it's a Callaway Steelhead 3 five wood, which has been in the bag now for <laughs> 23 <laughs> years. So I remember putting it at the end of the amateur golf, I uh, had a great season as an amateur at the end there to then turn pro on. So the five wood was in then, and it, it stayed in ever since up until now, but... I managed to break it in Scotland last week, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, by accident, naturally, uh, just doing drills on the range. But it's had, it's a bit like Trigger's Broom. It's had, uh, I think, two new heads, about four new shafts, and about 18 new grips, but it's still <laughs> effectively the same club. Um, and it's something that I've had in here yeah, for a long time, and it'll be in there for many years to come when it gets repaired. Well, fingers crossed you get it back in there sooner rather than later. Well, from one great Welsh sportsman to another, and this week's tournament host, Gareth Bale. Improving, erratic, <laughs> and um, enjoyable. Tiger Woods and, and Rory McIlroy, and, and obviously myself. The best part of my game Probably my iron play. <laughs> it's a difficult question. Depends what day it is, I think. <laughs> Going under par for the first time. Um, yeah, I think I had like a three footer to go under par for Billy on the last, and my hands were shaking. <laughs> um, I'd like to think myself. We haven't actually played yet because obviously there's been a lot of restrictions with COVID and stuff, so uh, I'd like to think myself. I'd have to say the winning goal at a World Cup. Um, obviously everyone knows how proud I am to play for Wales and um, as much as it would be tempting to, to hold the winning putt at the Ryder Cup, yeah, I, I, it's no doubt for, for Wales. Brilliant to have Gareth Bale involved this week. John, what does that mean for the tournament to have a, a spokesperson, an ambassador like him? Well, he's huge, isn't he? He's a superstar of the football world and, yeah, I mean, like... I mean, he can't be here with us this week, but what a lovely guy. Um, so enthusiastic about the game, loves it. Here's his profile, look at it, age 33, 11 years younger than me. I'm not jealous, honestly. And he's got air. Handicapper yeah. 3, good player, isn't he? Josh, you had a chat to him last night on Zoom. Didn't I you? actually did. Uh, look, I'm a massive Tottenham fan, so this guy is kind of a, a hero of mine, really. But what I, when I speak to him, he's a completely down-to-earth guy. And you know what? He really cares. He cares about Wales. He's obviously great at football. He loves his golf as well. And now as, as he's getting on in years in football, he wants to give back to the people here, to the people in Wales, the people in the golfing community. This week, there's I think there's over 500 kids, families, girls coming for some one-on-one -on -one coaching, 
get to watch the event as well and getting communities in Wales involved that wouldn't necessarily be involved and he wants to give back and give chances to those people that he didn't have a chance of when he was younger and I really admire him for that I admire him for a lot of things. Were you, were you a bit starstruck yesterday oh, when you were on the Zoom I met, him, because, so yeah. I met him in Spain last year for the first time and I was a little starstruck but you know what he is just a completely down to earth he's very quiet and genuinely a really really nice guy but I, I really admire him for coming here and giving back you know as I said he didn't have the chance he said when he was yeah. younger um, and he's doing it now. Fair play to he's him. He's got the plan for it. Yeah. platform for it. Well done. Yeah. yeah, brilliant ambassador for sport in general and South Wales and this week. And it is week 28 of 44. And what a season it's been so far. Yet I'm still here, cracks. Like Thomas Peters is back at golf's top table. To keep us safe. Victor Hovland secures the Slink Dubai Desert Classic title. If the mice catch me now. Augusta Coles and Scotty answers. from Olison. It's PGA number two. A victory for Victor Perez. History's been made in Sweden. We have a female champion on the DP World Tour. And quite the team, Matthew Fitzpatrick and Billy Buster are. Brilliant from Hao Tong Lee, overcome with emotion. Xander Schauffele, he is a Rolex Series winner. Sensational Smith, what a final round. It's time to welcome another former Ryder Cup player with very, very special memories of this place. Eduardo, it's brilliant to have you with us. What's it like to come back here to Celtic Manor? Thank you for having me, first of all. Uh, it's always very special. It brings back a lot of memories, even if it's uh, 13 years ago now. But uh, every time we come here, it's, uh, it's always very special and uh, it's something that I always enjoy doing. What are the big memories from that week that live with you? Well, I think uh, there's a lot of stuff. There's uh, a lot of laughs in the, in the <laughs> team room. Mm -hmm. There's uh, the first tee, the first day, it was just unbelievable. There's only two Molinaris. Yeah, two Molinaris, the song, <laughs> there was uh, echoing everywhere. <laughs> uh, you know, it was just a, an unbelievable week and, uh, and something I wish I could uh, live again. And what was it like to share it with your brother, Francesco? Well, again, it's, uh, it's something very unique. Uh, I think we were the, the first uh, two set of brothers to do it in a, in a long, long time. And uh, we were, you know, we were very close to each other. We would always play golf together, so it was a, a dream come true for us, for the whole family, for the friends. It was, a, it was fantastic. And great emotion as well you were showing there as well. How different did it feel, and how different did you perform due to that in terms of those outpourings of emotion and getting the fans going? Well, obviously the, the emotions were really high. Uh, there was a, you know, the crowds were massive. Uh, because you know it's not the the number of crowds but I think it's only four matches on the course at the same time mm -hmm. so everyone goes to to the same matches and it's just uh, you know the look and the feel is unbelievable and then there's a you know proper support like a like a football game <laughs> and I guess we do react like a football game sometimes <laughs> Josh have we got some questions coming yeah. for Eduardo? I spoke to Luis Finch has asked this question and I spoke to Ross Fisher yesterday yeah. uh, who was part of that team with you here at 2010 and I'm going to ask you about first tee nerves, because he said all he was thinking about was putting the ball on the tee. And that's all he wanted to do. What were your nerves like, Louise asks? Yeah, well, I wasn't too bad for two reasons. One is uh, Francesco hit the first tee shot in foursomes. So I was down the fairway and you know, off we go. <laughs> so, um, but he, he, you know, he striped it like, uh, like he always does and, uh, and it was good. 
Uh, and then, to be honest, I, I don't remember feeling particularly nervous, like more than like being in contention at, at a big event. Mm. Uh, I, I just remember just having a lot of fun, um, you know, both with the crowds, playing golf, uh, and you know, I never really felt one moment in the whole week where I was uh, overwhelmed by by the pressure. It was just uh, I remember a lot of fun and and just a great opportunity to, to play some good golf. Can I ask, what's the walk to the first tee is like, like as well? Because you see so many fans, the atmosphere's built. That first tee of 2010, by the way, was amazing. It's one of the best, I think, ever in Ryder Cup. Yeah, it was unbelievable. I mean, got a couple of stories. So one is uh, the first morning, Francesco and I were not playing because we were playing in the afternoon. Uh, but we thought, right, we're going we're gonna to be up anyway. We're just going to go down to the first tee and see the first match tee off. And as we're driving down the hill, it was foggy, wet, windy, cold, I mean, you name it. <laughs> and we thought, well, it's not going to be anyone on the tee. And then the car drops us off here at the clubhouse. And when we're walking down, I mean, we're probably 400 yards away. And we could hear the crowd singing, wow. which is like crazy. And then, I mean, I remember the, the moment we walked onto the tee, everyone started singing two Molinari's. And it was just, <laughs> it, it was crazy. It was like 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you, you don't expect that. Can you sing it for us? No, I can't. I'm not a good singer at all. Um, so, what was the question again? Yeah, the walking to the first tee and the atmosphere yeah. on that tee. Yeah, and, the, and then you know, the atmosphere on the tee was just uh, unbelievable. I mean, they had songs for each one of us. Amazing. Uh, it was uh, unbelievable and, and something I, I never been to a Ryder Cup before then. And uh, I think it was a good idea to walk on the tee mm. that morning just to experience it and, and see it firsthand because it was uh, just, you know, I'm impossible to, to imagine. Yeah, amazing. Well, Eduardo will be on the tee in Rome next year as a vice captain, and Luke Donald will be leading out the team. Well, I think this is probably the greatest honor you know, of, uh, of my lifetime. Um, to be announced as Ryder Cup captain is, is certainly extremely exciting, um, and, and the biggest honor that uh, I think you could bestow upon a golfer. You know, it's almost like a lifetime achievement award. I'm uh, obviously very excited to get going and uh, looking forward to, to getting to Rome in, in 14 months. Well, Eduardo, I mean, there, there's our, uh, your captain there, Luke Donald. How are you feeling about this now? I think he's, uh, he's fantastic. He's going to be a great captain for our team. Um, I, I was able to speak to him a few times in the last week. Yeah. And he seems uh, very happy, obviously, very motivated, very keen to do a great job for, uh, for all the players, the caddies, the staff, everyone involved. And uh, I think we might see a slightly different side of Luke. He's always been very, mm -hmm. very quiet, very, you know, by himself. Yeah. Obviously, he needs to come out of his shell a little bit, and I'm sure he'll be, I'm sure he'll be an we'll unbelievable captain. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you, I mean, you know, we've seen all the commotion here. You, Ricky Fowler, coming down the last year. I mean, it was a lot of emotion going on. You probably thought, have I lost it, have I won it, or whatever. You know, Graham McDowell comes up with the, the final putt there against yep. Hunter Mayhem. But the scenes here, champagne, screwing over <laughs> all the crowd, all the celebrations, seeing your photos in the clubhouse. Mm. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was mad. I remember we, when I finished my match, we all went uh, back to see GMAC playing um, 16 and 17. Yeah. And the moment he finished, then all the crowds were on the greens. We basically couldn't, couldn't see each other for the next hour or so. Yeah. <laughs> and then we managed, you know, one by one to, to come back to the clubhouse. And we all stood on the terrace there. And it was just uh, crazy scenes with, you know, champagne. There were people throwing their shoes, their shirts into the crowds as a, as a, as a gift. <laughs> it was just, uh, I mean, crazy. Um, right. Also, um, Ross told me last night, and I don't think many people will know this, you have your own locker downstairs. All the yeah. players from 2010 have their very own locker, so you could pitch up this with you and Ross, you knew exactly where you were going. Yeah, yeah, it's always been the same locker since 2010, and it's very nice because every time we come back, they, they always give us the same locker, so you know exactly where it is, and, and uh, it's just a nice little touch from, from Celtic Manor and something that we appreciate a lot. Did you keep a few things in the locker? No, I don't. So because when you I open it, you go, oh, there it is. No, because I think <laughs> you get used, to, you yeah. get used oh, to in the yeah. year. So it's not our, our locker, but yeah. still, when, when we come for the event, it's nice to have uh, your own locker. Uh, brilliant. Eduardo, you're a smart guy. You love the data. You love the analytics. Is that what you're going to bring to the team room as well in Rome next year? Yeah, I think uh, part of my job would be exactly that, as you mentioned. Uh, I'm, I've been working with uh, a few of the players who will definitely be in the team. Uh, some others are you know, on the outskirts of the team or they have a chance to, to make it. 
uh, and then we'll just bring it to, to a different level with uh, you know, all the 12 players involved, make sure we get the pairings right, we get the, the wild cards right. And uh, I think it's, it's quite an important part of the Ryder Cup and, and hopefully it's something I can do successfully to, to help Luke and the team. Absolutely. Josh, we've got a few more questions coming in. Yeah, we've had in. plenty more questions coming in. Sam Hutchinson asks, what did you learn from 2010, especially from the vice captains, you had Darren Clark, Sergio, that you can use and take into next year as a vice captain? I think there's a few things. I think uh, communication is massive because uh, even in practice rounds, I think as a player you want to know who you might be paired with, uh, uh, you know, what's the plan going forward. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to play the practice round not knowing what's going to happen on Friday. So I think uh, communication will be very big. Um, and then the other thing is just trying to, you know, to instill in the players like the, how much the Ryder Cup means to, to mm. us Europeans, to this tour, uh, why it's so important and just make sure, well, I'm, I'm sure that there won't be an issue, but everyone needs to be 100% focused and, and motivated to, to try and win it back. Mm. And also Liam Walker has asked, you're obviously out here on tour, are you keeping an eye on a few players to maybe say to Luke, look, this guy's playing pretty well. If he doesn't qualify automatically, he could be a good captain's pick. Yeah, I mean, we, we try to play with guys that uh, might make the team. Just uh, more than looking how they play, because that's easy to do with the data. It's just uh, getting comfortable with them, getting them comfortable with, with us. I mean, some, some, young, some guys are pretty young mm. and uh, I play a lot of events out here, but some of the other vice captains maybe didn't play as much. So it's just uh, trying to get everyone comfortable and familiarised with. Interesting. Very Eduardo, good. thank you so much for popping in. It's been great thank to chat. Have a fantastic week again here at Celtic <laughs> Manor. Well, yesterday, John and I went for a little walk down on the driving range. Right, we've come down onto the range here at Celtic Manor. I've got Johnny Morgan alongside me and we can both promise you it's definitely warmer than it looks. It's going to be a sunny week. But right now, let's go and chat to some players. We've got our first victim, Lucas Beauregard, ready for a little chat. Lucas, good to see you. How are you? How are you, Marco? You all right? All good. Mate, sharp dressed man. How are you beating him at the moment? Yeah, it's getting, it's getting better. Yeah. yeah. Working on uh, getting a little depth to the backswing there and that seems to be helping me find me a little bit of time. When did you get here? Did you get here yesterday? Or you, I got uh, here yesterday, yeah. Hit played, the course already? Yeah, I played uh, a few holes, played about nine holes yesterday. It's beautiful, it's in good condition. Really? Yeah, it's, it's firm. Uh, green's a little bit firmer than the last few times I've been here. So it'll be, uh, it'll be a good test, that's for sure. How much different to the Lynx courses that we've been playing over the last few weeks is it? Um, a, a, l a little bit. I mean, obviously the, the design and the way that the course is played is very different, but it's it's similar firmness. So, um, I mean, it's going to be some of these fairways going to be tough to hold because they're a little bit slopey, a little bit angled, um, and it's going to be really important to hit the fairways because the, the greens are pretty firm as well. Hopefully, we won't get too much rain the next few days, so they they stay like that but they're, they're rolling nice and uh, yeah I mean I think the last few times I've been here it's been qu quite wet and, and, and uh, so it's playing different I, I definitely noticed a few different cups off the tees yesterday than I've been used to so brilliant Lucas thank you for your time best of luck this week Thanks, guys. Have a good we'll see you soon right just behind him here's a man making history this week 700th DP World Tour oh appearance God, for David Howe how 700 appearances, that's it's incredible. A lot, isn't it? There ain't that many grey hairs in there. Actually. Well, I don't know, there's no hair on the top of my head, that's the problem. Same here, mate, don't worry about it. <laughs> You've got the combination of my grey beard and John's lack of hair. There we go, that, looking at the two of you, that's, I'm going to go and change things. <laughs> yeah, mate, I would do so. <laughs> so, are you swinging it then, boss man? Uh, very well, a bit better actually, yeah. yeah. The scores aren't quite showing it, but played all right last week. I mean, I missed the cut by a mile. I seem to have lost the knack of scoring, which is a bit of a shame because that's what this game is all about. But yeah. starting to hit it better and, uh, and still, in, you know, we're not, not enjoying my form, but I'm still loving the, uh, the idea of playing golf, getting up every morning. Yeah. was out with the swing trainer last night trying to get a bit more speed. Oh, yeah. A couple of putting sessions at Queenwood at 7 o'clock this week before the kids got up. So, yeah, all over it. All Still over grinding it. it. 700 appearances in. Looking back, did you ever think you'd get to 700? Do you know what? I didn't think I'd get to one. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, right. it's a funny thing when you're, when you're trying to become a pro. And uh, I remember getting him a tour card. That was amazing. I was like, pinch yourself, you know, yeah. play on tour. And then, um, yeah, fairly quickly, I guess, I got pretty settled on the tour. And uh, it's been my whole life. It's been a life's work, you know. I, I, I got on tour when I was 20. I've never done anything else. I love it out here. I'm institutionalised, that's for sure. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I wish my form was, it was better. But, uh, you know, it's been an amazing, what is it, 27 years. Um, 
<laughs> even just saying that is remarkable, yeah, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> um, so, yeah, of course, you can't look at... Um, when you start off, you can't even imagine that you're going to be yeah. going that long. Yeah. If you could, it would actually be very helpful. You'd do things somewhat yeah. differently. Um, it might have taken a few more years to get to 700 uh, if, you, if you get the drift. But um, uh, no, it's been wonderful. I love the, the DP World Tour. It's in, it's in here with me and uh, um, I'm very privileged to still be here. We're, We're at a credit to our sport, mate. You're a credit to our sport. Well, under here. We're at a former Ryder Cup venue, two-time Ryder Cup. I've got to ask you, how special are those memories for you? Oh, incredible, yes. Um, you know, that was after a few years on tour, that became my, my main driving focus. You start off, can I earn a living? Can I stay out here? Can you make a few quid? Let's face facts. You know, you're out here to, to, to earn a living to start off with. You can think about some glory. Um, and step by step, you eventually get to a point where you think, OK, can I make that team? And that was what inspired me as a kid, watching Ryder Cups you know, as, a, as, a, as a teenager. And that became my sole goal in the early 2000s, playing a winning Ryder Cup side I wanted to experience. And I managed to do that twice. And it was, uh, yeah, incredible, um, incredible experiences. Yeah, ones, that, of course, you'll never forget. And you only have to think about them and it brings a smile to your face. A wonderful career and it's great you're still out here and enjoying it. That's the important thing. David, wish you all the best in your 700th start. Thanks very much. Good Thanks to very much. Well, <laughs> right, we're going to have a little wander a bit further down the range. A bit breezy out here, John. How tricky does that make it when you're trying to work on your swing and what's going on? And it's yeah. a bit of a sort of into left to right breeze as well. So. What can you do to mitigate that when you're practicing? Well, it's shot shaping, ball flight, everything. I reckon the players will be changing up a bit of their gears. They'll be putting a few two irons in. I mean, they come from a couple of links golf courses they've been playing over the last couple of weeks. Now coming to a real kind of inland, blustery kind of conditions. I mean, it's going to be a completely different ball game. I mean, uh, I'm going to come and see this man, Stephen Brown. It looks like he's uh, he's on the boat. He's probably he's on the a little chat. He's, he's probably on the on the phone to his coach saying, "This move ain't quite working. <laughs> I need to do something else." But you know, he's a he's a hard worker, hard grafter. This boy, are you, Stevie boy? Stephen Brown, everybody. Hey, John, Steve, good to see you. How are you doing? So, what are you working on, boss? What we got going on? Working on quite a lot. Actually. How much have you got? <laughs> just to do it, just to do it. Uh, What's going well, down? I've, I haven't been playing that great recently, so um, just working on some technical stuff with the swing. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is the best straight into the wind, but it's, it's certainly. Uh, it I will need to definitely put the show in. you where your weaknesses are. Yeah, into exactly. Wind, no? Yeah, well, that's, exactly. I've got to put the reps in right now. Cause yeah. I'm struggling a bit, so yeah. Good. Is there any kind of change up in the bag as well for this week? Have you have you have yeah. done a whole remodel? I've got a lot of clubs in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's more than 14. Yeah. Any going spare? I just do that yeah. to annoy the caddy on practice day. Really. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, well, for me, around here, it's just basically driver everywhere. <laughs> there, yeah. isn't, there isn't much other than that, so I'll probably put the seven wood in, the old heaven wood. Oh, yeah? Yeah, help me. Uh, Fly it in nice and high exactly, and stop yeah. it quick. Yeah, I mean, you can do that with a long iron, but I can't. So <laughs> right, I, I, no, I need the seven wood right. to help me out. But yeah, other than that, it's. I don't change up very much, to be honest. I'll change between the seven wood and the two iron, yeah. depending on the week. Uh, but this week, it's not much off the tee. It's all into the greens. But I'll yeah. need it, maybe par five, so I'll go seven wood. I know I was just going to ask you, just tell us one move that you are trying to do. Yeah. Come on, then. I know you said you're working on a couple of things just there, yeah. but I just want to... Well, for me, I, I've been getting quite stuck like this way, steep in the shoulders. Yeah. So I'm working on trying to almost work on a bit of a flatter. Way. So okay. Straight away, it's more rotation. Hip works back around me more rather than slide. yeah the old slide with the yeah. left hip. So I wouldn't and recommend. Stuck. Would not recommend that. No, no, I don't recommend it either. I mean that's wise words from anyone, you know. Yeah, so, exactly, yeah. but mate, yeah, just keep beating balls. Are you hitting the golf course in a minute? Yeah, I'm playing nine this afternoon. Yeah, and, uh, hopefully it's not raining at that point. Yeah, no. Well, be beautiful by then. Right, we'll leave you to put the work in. Great to see you. Have a great nice week. To you, boy. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate. Right, that's all we've got time for down here on the range from me and John E. Morgan. So let's head back into the studio. Well, Josh has been to check out the 12th hole and relive an incredible moment from Tiger Woods. The 12th hole here at Celtic Manor could prove to be one of the trickiest all week. Playing 458 yards from back here on the tips. If the wind swirls like it does today, I think it could play well over 500. A few decisions for the players from off the tee. They could go right, they could play safe. The rough down the right-hand side, if they push one, it's not too thick, but it'll leave them a longer shot into the green. Or they could play aggressive down the left-hand side, but there's water all down that left-hand side. They slightly draw one, it's three off the tee from here. Let's go and have a look at the approach into the green. The left-hand side of this 12th fairway is not where you want to be. It's absolutely heaven 
for those guys though, up here on the fairway, is where you want to be. If you do take that aggressive line over the bunker here, it's going to leave you about 130, 140 into this green. There's a huge false front here on 12. Anything short, and if the conditions are dry, it could well go back into the water. A few decisions from the fairway for the players. Back in 2010 though, it didn't cause a problem for one man. 11-9 down to Europe and in his match against Francesco Molinari. He was already two up. He'd been playing terribly all week. Tiger Woods produced this moment of magic. Now Woods is in a really good run of form. in the foursomes and four balls he looked completely out of sorts give him his own ball let him play on his own and he's much better and he's only just found out that it's actually in the hole like he and steve williams has got it hadn't realized but straight in at 12. the green up here on 12 is guided by three bunkers are the two to the left not really in play, the one behind me definitely is. It's like a little upturned saucer, this green, with plenty of runoffs that will really test the player's short game. I mentioned the false front. If a player gets it slightly wrong, spins it too much, in today's conditions, it's not going to reach the water. But if it dries out here this week, that could very well go into the H2O. And it'll, even if it doesn't, it'll still test the player's short game from there. A par here is a fantastic score and they'll be running to the next tee. Let's get back to the studio. An incredible moment in Ryder Cup history. I'm a little bit disappointed though, Josh. I thought you might be reenacting that Jeff Overton boom baby boom. moment. Well, I was very tempted. <laughs> it was that or the Tiger Woods hole out. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I know. Jeff Overton, what's happened to him? Well, he tried to make a little comeback on he the did, PGA Tour. That was a great yeah, moment though. It was. So tell us what's been going on in the poll. What do the people think? There's a clear winner. Okay. It is. It's 14 under or better. It's 71%. Okay. It's, wow. So people think the players are maybe going to rip the course up, possibly. Yeah. I mean, we're right in the meat of the season now. Everyone's really on form. You know, players. a lot of players have played here before as well. There's some, yeah. there's some courses on tour that they haven't played. Plenty have played around here as well. Yeah, but you've just alluded to it on the 12th hole there in your segment. You know, if it dries out, we're going to see yeah. the scoring not as low, mm -hmm. I don't think. You know, softer conditions, their attacking flags are able to go for it. You know, the ball's going to be stopping quick. They'll be able to control it a lot better. So, yeah, all weather permitting, Josh. Can they put sneaky pins here? Oh, oh my God, yeah. can they? Jeez Louise, they can tuck them right by over, you know, like you come to... I mean, there's so many holes you could really go down, like six, I think it's a great part for around the water, you know, water's all on the right hand side, you can stick that pin way over on the right, you know, horrible pin location, you have to bail out long and left, there's many pin positions around here, Joss, and uh, yeah, it'll be a tough task. Yeah. Alright John, we've got to just briefly talk about this finishing hole as yeah. well, because it is, it's a beast, but it is a par five, it's an opportunity at the end, but we're going to see drama, aren't we? We are, and especially, we've got a new, we got a new tee box, the other side of the path, way back up there, and uh, you know, I don't know if anyone will be able to get past Nicholas Colesarch's so black, <laughs> that's for sure, uh, I don't think the conditions warrant that, but then, if Josh says, it, it dries out, the sun comes out to play, the ground is still firm underfoot, it hasn't, the rain hasn't quite bedded through, but my goodness, if you're way back and you've got three wood in your hand coming to this green, all penalty is short. You only have to be, you can be a foot on the green, it's back in the water. You know, it's all shaving down, it's, the ball's not going to stop. We're going to see a lot of balls in that water, so get your swimsuits on if you go in there. <laughs> but uh, it's a great finishing hole, literally, you know, welcome to Kazoo Open, bring it on. John, Josh, it's been great to thanks, have guys. you with us. Big thanks to Jamie Donaldson and Eduardo Molinari for popping in as well. That's all we've got time for on this edition of the Zoom Virtual Clubhouse. But make sure you tune in. Enjoy what promises to be an epic tournament here, the Kazoo Open, supported by Gareth Bale at Celtic Manor. And we will see you again next time in the Zoom Virtual Clubhouse.